And so it's, it's really a treat that on this episode, we're going to have one of the foremost whiskey ex experts in the United States. So cheers to you. I'm actually drinking a little bit of uh, Nika coffee grain from Japan. Oh, okay. I have that one in my bar as well. Yeah. Cheers. Mm. It's one of my favorites. Um, this is um, it, this is made on a coffee still, and a coffee still um, is a special kind of still that has a really kind of a cool history. And there's only only three of them, I think, really still operating in the world. Who are you? And where are you going? What do you want? Together, we'll find the ideal path on The Way to Wow Show with your host, Kevin Bemmel. If you're brand new to the show, you may not know it, but cocktails and spirits are really embedded to what we do here every day. And so it's, it's really a treat that on this episode, we're going to have one of the foremost whiskey ex experts in the United States Robin Robinson as our guest. So Robin has written the complete whiskey course. I've, I've taken his course and I'm telling you whether you're a longtime whiskey aficionado or whether you're, you're new to whiskey, you will learn a tremendous amount uh, with, with Robin's book and his course. So we're gonna be working in the play realm of the physical pillar but you'll see that Robin has taken this love that he has, and it's, he's made it his career. And that's one of the things we're going to talk to him about is, is how do you do that? So normally, I'd mix up a cocktail, or we'd have a bartender mixing up a cocktail. But in honor of our guest, I'm gonna, just going to have uh, one of my favorite ryes. This is a Sagamore Spirit rye. And I was in Washington, D.C. several years ago to be at the... A retirement ceremony of a Navy friend of mine and I went into one of the local liquor stores and I said what's what's a great local whiskey that you have particularly a rye whiskey and this is what he gave me and I'm telling you I fell in love with it it's it's just got such a great nice spicy flavor the way rye whiskey does is distinguished from say bourbon or a wheat whiskey or something like that so I'm just gonna pour myself a little shot I'm thinking Robin will probably tease me because I'm not using the right kind of glass but we'll see and I'll see you over in the interview. Cheers. Robin, so so nice to meet you. So glad to have you on the Way to Wow show. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Great. Thanks for having me on, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. So, uh, you know, in your honor, I have uh, one of my favorite whiskeys. This is Sagamore Spirit Rye. Um, and I, I, I told the story in the intro that I, uh, I found it when I was in Washington, D.C. for the uh, uh, retirement ceremony for a Navy colleague of mine. But it's, I, I love rye whiskey, and this one is so good. So, And it's, you know, it's out, it's out of Baltimore, and there's a whole lot of naval crossover there in Baltimore. So, so cheers to you. I'm actually drinking a little bit of uh, Nika coffee grain from Japan. Oh, okay. I have that one in my bar as well. Cheers. Yeah. cheers. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's one of my favorites. Um, this is um, it, this is made on a coffee still, and a coffee still um, is a special kind of still that has a really kind of a cool history. And there's only only three of them, I think, really still operating in the world. One's in Japan making this one. One's in um, in Scotland, and one's in Canada. So this is kind of being made on a very very um, unique still. So, so, Robin, I'm going to read a short uh, bio about you, and then we'll jump right in the interview. Okay. Robin Robinson has built small brands for most of his working life and is currently working with small spirits brands across the U.S. as a brand Sherpa. I love, I love that term. To help them enter and endure a volatile and competitive marketplace. Previously, he helped build the Compass Box Whiskey Company as its U.S. brand manager and brand ambassador. And before that, he had careers in tech, and in the tech and entertainment industries. And so you, sir, are no stranger to the Wicked Stage, are you? Perhaps Robin is best known for his book, The Complete Whiskey Course, A Comprehensive Tasting School in 10 Classes, 
which I, I, I showed your book in the intro and mentioned I, I went through the, the course myself. I found it incredibly enlightening, um, even though I'm kind of an old whiskey guy myself. As I mentioned in the intro, you, you, we're going to delve into the play realm of the physical pillar, and we're going to talk about how you got into whiskey, you know, really as a career, um, and, and really made your work play, which I think a lot of us would love to do, but, you know, how do you get there? So, so let's, let's start right there. How did you go from being an actor to sales in the tech industry to whiskey? How did that, how did that have developed? Well, I, I will tell you one thing. I mean, and I'm going to say this from the perspective of being uh, that we both live in 2021. Um, I was just damn lucky. And I can tell you that I had opportunities that opened up, but I was able to take advantage of them, you know, that maybe somebody else may not have gotten. Um, I, um, you know, I started out as an actor and I was grinding it out on the street um, for many, many years uh, around the country um and in new york city and then i got a modicum of success in new york city uh doing uh, television commercials and so um i wanted to expand on that and so i moved my family out to los angeles and um i took a um i took a uh, uh, a seminar from a guy who was a casting director out there for mash you know and uh, and it was how to market yourself as an actor and um, it was a, a six-week course, and it literally transformed. It did two things. It transformed my approach to the industry, and it actually opened a door for me to get out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, it, it was an ironic uh, um, uh, uh, end result. And at the same time, I had been learning all of the new technology that was coming out in the 1980s about computers and desktops and word processing and um, IBM and Windows and things like that. And I was doing a lot of temp work for that. And when I kind of came to this decision at one point where I'm not going to be an actor anymore, um, I started to kind of see the writing on the wall. I had this sort of other skill set that I had developed, you know, instead of waiting tables or, 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 or driving cabs as a support job. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it, I moved from one opportunity into the other um, until uh, a company in a Silicon Valley company that was really hot, big, you know, NASDAQ hot, um, uh, asked if I was interested in taking a position that would move me back to New York City and open up an office in New York City, and I said, "Yeah, let's do it." And so I moved my family back to the New York area again, and um, and so I was happily being traded back and forth in tech uh, in Silicon Valley companies for the next five or six years, um, going from a customer success position to various sales positions, and all the stuff that I had learned on the street as a guerrilla salesman, as a as an actor was now actually being systematized and a, a, a methodology was being applied to that uh, to do enterprise level sales. All the time, I had picked up this bizarre obsession for something called single malt scotch whiskey back from my acting days. Mm. And in the tech, in my tech days, um, I had a, an expense account. So I was actually able to indulge myself even a little bit more. And, um, in the early 2000s, I had started a blog. I put together like a tasting group of some neighborhood uh, friends of mine who were just tired of me droning on and on and on about whiskey. And they didn't know anything other than Johnny Walker Black. And I'm talking about single malt scotch. And, and one thing led to another until a, a, an old friend of mine um, who I've known for many years and who's uh, uh, very high up in the liquor industry had been sort of watching over the last couple of decades this growing obsession with whiskey. And he read a lot of my blog pieces and came to one or two of my tastings. And he says, you know, what are you doing with selling technology? You're in the wrong industry. You know, you know more about whiskey than the people who work for me. And, you know, one day you and I are going to have a talk. And then one day we actually had the talk. 
And he laid out a position for me that, he, you know, it, it wasn't just get in the industry. It was get in the industry and make a change. And that's kind of what lit me up. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I did. I switched to a third career. And that's how I started off with Compass Fox as their U.S. First as their brand ambassador and then as their U.S. brand manager and sales manager for about six years. Um, at that time, then I saw this growing, growing movement of these new tech, uh, of, of these new um, whiskey companies and, and distilleries that were growing. And it reminded me of the tech boom of the 90s and the early 2000s. And I said, oh, my God, I know exactly where this is going to go. It's going to like, you know, it's going to have nuclear fission. And I want to be part of that. So um, I started this, con you know, this consulting company where I'm kind of like a brand Sherpa. And, um, and that's kind of like, you know, how I got to where I'm at today. Hmm. Wow. So it really, you, you know, you said at the beginning it was luck, but it sounds to me like there was actually a lot of pre-planning there and a lot of ground laying. You know, they, they, they say, um, I don't know if you've ever read the book, uh, The Richest Man in Babylon, you have to entice the goddess of good luck. And that sounds like what you did. I, I, I agree 100%. Uh, I and, and I think I was doing that subconsciously. Um, um, you know, it, it, you're always laying groundwork for something else. You know, you can go back to biblical, you know, planting seeds and, and some of them are going to, you know, are, are going to grow. Um, there's a lot of metaphors you can use. The metaphor that I've actually been sort of working on for the, my overall life philosophy is that there are two types of boaters out on the water. There are power boaters and there are sailboaters, and they each get from A to B in two completely different ways. Power boaters believe in the force of their own nature, and then they, you know, they may actually find a, a direct way to get there. I found out that I'm more of a sailboater, and um, and so, which means I know how to read the wind, and I know which winds are going to pick up my sails and get me to where I'm at. Um, a power boater can run out of um, uh, they can run out of fuel, and uh, they can also you know go into areas where they shouldn't go. And on the other hand, for sail boaters, will hit dead spots, and in boats and in, in, in where there's no wind at all. And both of them have to know what to do with those downtimes uh, in order to be able to actually you know uh, power through or sail through. When, when when that time comes and so yeah i've always been kind of like the sailboater guy you know um it's, it's and, actually, and that's for somebody who didn't grow up on a sailboat you know? so <laughs> I'm, picking, I'm just picking metaphors out of the out of the air here. yeah no i think that's a that's actually a great metaphor so i you know one of the things i've often thought about is, in terms of turning uh, you know kind of a, a hobby that's a passion into a career is having to do it every day is is it really going to be as much fun as a job as it is as a hobby so how did you sustain your interest when now all of a sudden you're not doing it out of pure passion now now it, you know it is it, it's it's your source of income right right oh yeah um i can tell you that um i modified my view right i modified my view of the end product so the end product is a bottle of whiskey and, um, but what I was able to do was sort of take everything that I learned as an actor and everything I learned as a tech sales guy and push that into whiskey, into a bottle of whiskey. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I was transforming things. I was bringing an added value. And if you're looking for that one thing that allows me to get up in the morning, you know, and, and do this over again, it's where am I bringing value? I'm, you know, bringing value to the marketplace. I'm bringing it to my client, the brand. Uh, I'm bringing it somewhere, and, uh, and and all the permutations that it takes to do that. So for me, it's sort of like an elaborate game that I'm playing, hmm. you know. And um, it's the value game, you know, where you know, uh, like you know, where. Where do, where, where do I have to compete and where can I go and put footsteps in the snow that no one's ever been before? And then what's the value of each one of those? And then so then what's the strategy behind that and the, what are the tactics that come out of the strategy? 
So I play these mental games all the time. And, uh, and that really allows me to, um, to be excited about it um, over and over and over again and not get jaded because there's an enormous amount of jadedness uh, in, in the liquor industry overall. Um, I, I, when I was interviewing for the book, I, I interviewed um, a, 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 a man named uh, Shinji Fukuyu, who was the chief blender at uh, Suntory and uh in in japan and i was uh i was out there talking with him and i asked him so what makes a blender what makes a blender i mean how do you because in japan the blender is at the top of the hierarchy mm -hmm. not the distiller but the blender so i said what makes that and he says well we gather people from all over the uh, the, the company to come in and, 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 and learn how to nose and learn how to be, uh, and, you know, learn how to do this. And after three years, if they still can do it with passion, we'll make it, we'll make them a blender. And I said, oh, that's like fantastic. Because you have to go through the, the, the slogging and, 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 and just like, you know, the, the, the blocking and tackling and get some enjoyment out of that. And I think that's one of the keys is, you know, sometimes people want to stay strategic on the top and they don't want to get their feet dirty anymore. And I don't mind getting my feet dirty, um, you know, um, so I'm able to play both of those th those areas. And it, it just keeps it incredibly, incredibly interesting for me. So um, what's the biggest challenge you've faced as someone who's, you know, working in the, in the spirits industry? Oh, well, in the beginning was establishing my credibility. Um, uh, that was, that was for me and it was interesting because I came in as an older person. And as soon as you start seeing gray hair and gray in the beard, I mean, you know, exactly there's expectations that people have on you. You know, I mean, I don't know, are you the wise sage, you know, and that means it's, Everything that comes out of your mouth has to be the wise, sage words of wisdom. But in a way, we get kind of caught up in that. And so I, you know, I, I was a, an autodidact. I, you know, I had read all the books and the blogs that were available on whiskey. And I had gone to Scotland in the 1990s and visited distilleries back then before it was popular. So I thought I knew something. But what I really needed to do was prove that. And so um, I started, uh, uh, th there's a place here in New York City called the Astor Center. And um, it's this beautiful sort of amphitheater classroom where they do like wine and, uh, and, and spirits and cocktail and combination um, like classes for, for, um, for consumers. And I asked them whether or not they had somebody doing like a whiskey 101 and they didn't. So I offered to do it and that ran for 11 years up until COVID. Wow. And, and with that, what I had done was I had established my expertise and, uh, and that allowed me to do something in the liquor industry that, uh, uh, which it was unheard of then, which was to become a thought leader. And I came out of the tech industry, and tech industry is all process, and and and, and, and there's a huge success um, uh, orientation toward it. Um, the liquor industry was completely different. It's it's a very gangster, uh, you know, if, you know, gangster post uh, prohibition gangster industry. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a thought leader, of somebody who comes in with you know, with a, a sort of a philosophy or a thought process or an idea about something and then pervades that out into the marketplace over and over again was not really, and, and, and does it freely, um, was not really heard of. So that gave me the opportunity to do that. And, and, and people started listening to me because it made sense and it fit in with their sense of reality around whiskey. And then I just enhanced and grew value for them. So. And that was that was one of the biggest challenges for me was just establishing some sort of you know credibility in the industry. So, last question: What do you what advice do you have for people who 
want to make spirits a serious hobby. You know, most of us probably are not going to work in the industry, but, but we can make it a, a, a passionate avocation. So what advice do you have for, for, for folks like us? First of all, do not take it seriously. Number one, this is fucking whiskey. If you're not having a good time, you're fucking up, right? So that's number one right there. And, and, and I'm saying that specifically because too many people are doing the opposite. There's you know, a preciousness that comes into any industry. And I'm seeing so much preciousness inside of the whiskey industry. I you know, want to stick a butter knife in my ear sometimes, you know? Um, it's the an, anathema uh, of, of what whiskey, whiskey is about enjoying it with a friend and talking about some of the cool things that you like about it, and then bringing another friend in to do it with. So if you come in with a sense of play, a sense of not taking yourself seriously, I've got a one-man show that I do called The Story of Whiskey, 60 Minutes of Bad Stand-Up Comedy Punctuated by Drinking. That should give you an <laughs> That should give you an indicator what you're what to expect, you know. And and not only that, but that is what keeps you sane. It's what keeps you on track. It was what keeps you balanced. In that, I respect the brands and I respect you know the making of this and and, and the stories behind them because I'm a natural storyteller. But let's face it, folks. You know, we're this is not brain surgery here, and we're not you know saving the third world directly. We're enjoying ourselves with a psychotropic drug. So let's keep that in, in perspective. <laughs> well, you know what, Robin? On, on that note, I'm going to thank you very, very much for coming on the show. <laughs> you, got, you got everybody out here laughing. You, you, can't, you can't see them all, but, but they're, all, they're all cracking up, and I, I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for coming on the show. I think we may need to have you come back again sometime soon. <laughs> okay, whatever. I love it, man. Hey, thanks. First of all, Kevin, this series you're doing, I think, is awesome. And, and so I'm really, really honored to be here. So thanks for uh, making me uh, part of it. I, I think you could tell that Robin had a background in acting, but really a truly dynamic performance and you could see the passion that he has for what he does. In that play realm, in the physical pillar, I think sometimes we get so involved with our play, we forget to heed his advice, which is, it's about the fun, right? We can work all day, but when we play, we need to have fun. So go out and have some fun. And make sure you have courage at all times, my friends. Marie. You're still my bell, darling. Sounds a little bit like Jean-Jacques Borg. <laughs> 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 darling. <laughs>